Blessed to be some children by Glendon Swarthout. Chapter 9. Sorry. You're sorry, Cotton blasted. One hell of a lot of good that does. Shecker and the Lally brothers jumped over the tailgate and Goodenow slid across the seat and out of the cab. But his lash tracked after them. Dings. Dings. Sweeties was right. We're dings. We can't do anything right. We've got no damn excuse for living in. He choked in mid-sentence. Curious, they gathered at the cab window, but he'd merely gone into another of his catatonic fits. Cotton sat upright at the wheel, his jaw outthrust under the army helmet, one hand grafted to the gear shift as though he were driving the truck himself, as though by motive, power of will, and energy generated by rage, he could refuel it and propel it onward. His mother had been married three times and divorced three times, and was now keeping a man ten years younger than she. Her favorite among the four was her second husband, a rich, grandfatherly manufacturer of ball bearings. It was his generous settlement upon the divorce which gave her the house in Rocky River and the membership in the Cleveland Yacht Club and made her wealthy in her own right. The manufacturer was certainly John Cotton's favorite, for he belonged to a fishing club in Quebec, and once, when John was ten, took mother and son up there after trout. They flew in from North Bay, Ontario, by float plane and landed on the lake near the cabin. The next morning, John and his stepfather went fishing, the boy trolling with the daredevil, the man paddling the canoe. One after another, the boy fought Ned and Quebec Reds, brook trout so-called because the coffee color of the water stained their undersides a vivid crimson. They drifted near a cow moose and a calf breakfasting on lily pads. It was a serene and thrilling morning. This was the best place he'd ever been, the boy blurted suddenly, and the best time he'd ever had, and he wished it would never end. His stepfather smiled. You're a Jim Dandy, Johnny. I wish I could keep you. Do you and her get divorced? The boy asked. Probably. She needs a younger man, and money even more. Her own money. I wish you wouldn't. The paddle his stepfather carved deep into the black of the lake. Perhaps she'd sell you to me. She probably would, the boy said. When they returned to the cabin, his mother, already bored with Quebec, wanted to fly back to Cleveland in the morning. Her son and husband objected. She made a scene and won. That night, ten-year-old John Cotton took a hammer and an awl, swam naked through icy water to the plane moored offshore, held his breath, ducked, and hammered a hole in the bottom of a float. In the morning, the play lay over one wingtip. The pilot had to hike through the bush to do Riviere and phone North Bay for a mechanic. It required three days to make repairs, and John Cotton caught another thirty-one trout. Knowing they could not have pried him loose from the steering wheel and gear shift to the crowbar, Five outside the cab turned away until he was released from seizure. When he was, when he had come to, the bed wetters were already isolating. What had been only minutes before a functioning unit had become a rabble. They blew about the pickup like tumbleweeds, nomads in wil the wilderness of self-doubt. Hither and yon they strayed, reabsorbed in self, their cause forgotten, each one tending the petty flock of his own anxieties. Cotton could have tied knots with their tensions. Had he been joker enough to honk a horn, they would have taken off for the moon like big-ass birds, sent in a gabbing orbit. He listened to them. Here we go again, he sighed, gathering nuts from the night. I'm tired, said smaller cowboy hat, pillow under its arm and thumb in its mouth. After all, I'm the youngest. Arnold Palmer's golf cap was taking a leak into a manzanita bush. Jeez, I'm dying of malnutrition, it said. We should have ordered those hamburgers to go, so it shouldn't have been a total loss. I'm hungrier than anybody, whined the Hopi headman. You guys at least had supper, and I lost mine. The Africa Corps maneuvered in circles around the truck. I got us wheels, and I drove us. Why do I have to be responsible for gas, too? I didn't want to come on this in the first place, grabbed the bigger cowboy hat, just because I'm stuck with a psycho brother. I missed the tube, said the smaller cowboy hat, ignoring bigger. It's not healthy for you to go without TV too long. I wish I was in Vegas right now, said Golf Cap, buttoning up. They cut the steak special for my father in Vegas. When I get home, resolved the big cowboy hat, I want a whole week tube time. Got my own color set. Hey, didn't I rupture that tire, though? Boom, boasted Rommel. How come I can't score on the range? There's one show I like, admitted Hopi Headman, because the guy's only got a little while to live. He might die any show. I'm sort of morbid that way. They wearied, they sickened. They gave Cotton a royal pain in the rear. Okay, he said to himself, let's just see. Let's turn off the damn set and see if they can survive on the real thing. Let's stick the horse opera back in the can and see if they're grown up en enough to live in this world. If they aren't, if they poop out now, the hell with the whole operation and the hell with them too, because if they aren't after this summer and all I've done for them 
They really are born losers. They really are dings. But if they can, they'll at least try to hack it without me. Then they're over the rim. They've won the big game. And when they fly home, they'll be okay. They can hack anything, even home. He left the cab, going around to the front end of the truck. He took off his helmet and cocked the boot up on the bumper. Automatically, the squad assembled and hunkered down around him quietly, as they had earlier in the piney woods. He laid on the line, he said. Running out of gas wasn't Teft's fault. It was everybody's. But it really louses up the operation. They had only a mile more to go, he said. But now, with no wheels, they had to think about afterwards. And consequences, there were two options. Hike back to the U.S. 66, hitch a ride into Flag, wire another car and rod back to Prescott and the horses, and they'd probably be back in camp and in bed before daylight. No one would know. No one would ever connect them. But go on, carry the thing through and lose that time, and they'd surely hit camp in broad daylight. The, the director would third-degree them about where they'd been, and even if they clammed up when they'd pulled off, when what they'd pulled off made the newspapers, he'd smell a rat, the stolen pickup in Prescott, abandoned out there, the locals and flag staff who would identify it and them, and the bedwetters would be in trouble, legitimate trouble with the camp and the law and their folks. So that was it. Head for home now and maybe make it in time or go on as, sure as hell, get caught, and it, w it wasn't worth it. So we're going to vote again, he said. I told you, I won't be head haunter this time. Before we vote, I want to say something you maybe haven't thought of. Sure, I know what we saw today. I mean yesterday. I know what it did to us, and we think tonight's something we have to do or we wouldn't be here. But if we think it'll make us heroes or any movie junk like that, it won't. No one else will give a damn but us. In fact, it'll make a lot of people mad enough to shoot us. What I'm saying is it doesn't matter to anybody but us, and in three days, don't forget, we break up. Camp's over. We'll probably never see each other again. He dropped his boot. Okay, we vote. Everybody's got to be in favor. All in favor of skipping the whole crazy deal and heading for camp and keeping our noses clean, raise your right hand. Instantly, he raised his right hand. He could not see their faces, but the effect on them, the shock was almost palpable. He kept his hand high. No one spoke. No one moved. Cotton, did you flake out? It was Lally, too, on his feet, throwing down his pillow. I was going alone till you talked me out of it. Now you get us out here and flake out yourself? Go find a bed, his brother sneered. Crawl into the truck. You shut up. Let's take another vote. All in favor of going on like we said, no matter what. Lally, too, raised his right hand. The other four were whipsawed, and with the two hands they squatted, contemplating their hang-ups on the rutted road beneath them. Lally, too, lowered his hand. Scornfully, he picked it up. He picked up the charred pillow. Scornfully, dusted it off. What a bunch of dings, he said. You can't do anything without cotton anymore. What do you do when you get home and he's not around? Tucking pillow under arm, he jerked the cowboy hat firmly over his ears. Well, I don't need anybody. I started out by myself, and I'm still going, and if anybody wants to tag along, they can. And away he went, into the dark, down the road, and as obdurately as he had the road through the piney woods. Cotton's arm was still high and tiring. He began to sweat. One gone, he thought, and five to go. Wait a sec, good and old, called after Lally, too. What? Would you help carry the head? I might. Good now moved to the truck bed and came back, lugging the buffalo head and horns. I'm sorry, Cotton, he said, but he's too little to go by himself. Lally once spat. Judas Priest. Why'd you have to say that? Now I have to go. Anything happened to him, our folks would cut me down. You wouldn't believe the way they baby him. He joined good now, and together they trudged off. Hey, you hear the one about the three storks? Checker asked, standing and rubbing his hands and preparatory to a monologue. Mama Stork asked the Papa Stork what he'd done that day, and he said delivered triplets. He asked what she'd done, and she said delivered twins. So the Mama and Papa Stork asked the Baby Stork what he'd done, and he said not much, but he sure scared hell out of a couple of teenagers. He bit a cuticle. Like the man says, when you gotta go, you gotta go. He rocked back and forth on his heels. It's you in the papers, or jail. <laughs> when he had gone, Cotton lowered his hand, Teft unwound himself, simulated a yawn, Faked a stretch, lifted the truck hood, unclipped his hot wire, coiled it into a pocket, dropped the hood, loitered to the cab, eased out the rifle, and lazed back to Cotton. So long, partner, he declaimed in his finest last reel into the sunset drawl. We've rode many a mile together, but now I reckon we've opened up two different cans of peaches. Head bowed, he flicked away an onion tear. Off Wiedersen. And about face, and he left Cotton alone by the truck, tramping down the road, tilted a little on the rift riffle side, dissolving at length into mist, for a thorn of loss pierced Cotton, and his eyes misted. It was true they no longer needed him. Standing there, he combed a hand through his red, matted hair, but after the pain, a vast, ripe grape of joy burst in him, and he was told, and he had told, had to hold on to keep from bounding after them, whooping and hollering. I didn't mean it. I wasn't flaking out. I was just putting you over a barrel to see what you'd, know, what you'd do, and now I know. You're great, you guys, great. 
No, we really can hack it. We can hack anything because you finally don't need me or anybody anymore. We're finally honest to God committed to something better than that, Teapot, and we did it ourselves. So let's go, God damn it. Come hell or high water or camp with a fuzz or a folk or the Viet Cong, let's go. He said he clapped on his helmet and took out after the troops. He marched. He did not run, tempting a slow, dignified cadence and fighting down an undignified impulse to whistle. In a minute or two, he picked them up by the white BC on their jackets. He kept going between and among them, and they cleared their throats in greeting and relief, then closed ranks around him and had the grace, for which he was thankful, to leave everything obvious unsaid. But he was embarrassed, and so were they, and after a while he broke it. Step it up, he said, sergeantly. Get the lead out. Up, up, up. 